Hello all, and welcome to Brewing with Jim, hosted by Jim Brewington. Jim is a pastor and a teacher, and has served in these roles for the past 45 years. He has worked in small churches and mega churches, primarily as a teacher serving both the hearing and the deaf population. We have surveyed the students here at CVCS and do our best to create a genuine conversation around the talking points the students want to know most about. Thank you all for listening and taking time to brew on Life's Questions with Jim. Hello all and welcome to Brewing with Jim. I am your producer, Grady Sanchez, and as always, we have Jim. How you doing, Jim? Good, thanks, Grady. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in to the show this week. We have one of the things that Jim likes to do and I like to do when starting a conversation is start to understand the definitions. And when we're having our walk with Christ, we need to understand what it is that people at church or other believers or other people in fellowship are actually trying to say to us. So today we're going to unpack what is Christianese, like what is, how is your walk, or just have faith, or all in God's timing. Can we, can we unpack <laughs> what, what those mean along with all the other things that maybe new people to church or young believers might be um, get it, trying to get into the lingo of Christianese and how they can also grow f- forth in their walk. Okay, let's do it. Um, let me think just a moment here. Why don't we um, why don't we define what Christianese is? Yes, please. Why don't we give a few examples of what Christianese is, and then you're going to hear. Um, my thoughts about Christianese. Let's and do it. I'm going to tell you why it's bad. Okay, there's the deal. Um, Christianity is really a subculture in any culture. You and I live in the United States. We live in Southern California. We have uh, we have a culture that is around. We have certain ways of speaking that uh, we use. Uh, we are a subculture. Now, subcultures almost always have their own, you said lingo, um, jargon, um, esoteric words that, uh, esoteric, uh, words that um, only a select group of people understand and people outside of that group usually does, don't understand. It's like an inside joke. And I have this, a a few of us understand and laugh, and the rest of the people don't understand. We have, uh, there's even argot, which is the language that's used among people in a profession. If I sit down and listen to three doctors having a conversation about some medical condition, they're going to use terms I don't understand. I'm not going to know what they're talking about. So in Christianity, we have the same thing. I think tragically, but we have the the same kind of jargon, the same kind of slang, the same kind of, here's the word again, uh, esoteria, esoteric language that people don't understand. You mentioned new people who in the church. What about people outside of the church who listen to Christians talking and throwing out these words and phrases and they don't uh, have a clue what we're really talking about? Um, I'll give you some examples of Christianese. Uh, one is I don't feel led. Uh, people, oh, I just am, would you like to do this? Would you like to do, well, I don't feel led to do that, which actually means the lead I'm feeling is in my pants. I just don't want to get up and do anything. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not comfortable with that. That's another uh, Christianese. I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, we're not put on earth to be comfortable. We're put on earth to do the work of God with, to, and to glorify him, uh, or that is to say reflect the glory to him. Um, I don't feel led. Um, how's your walk? How is your walk with the Lord? People outside of that don't, outside of Christianity, don't understand that. I think some people inside of Christianity don't understand that. Well, I'm walking with Jesus. Really, where are you guys going? And, and when will you get there? Uh, and do you enjoy it? Do you talk while you're walking? Um, another one is, oh, let's just let go and let God. What does that mean? I, it, it probably means surrender to the lordship of Christ, but if somebody outside of Christianity is going to think, uh, 
that means just calm down. Don't get so excited about this. Just let go. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Just let go. If I want somebody to agree with me or I'm talking to an audience, uh, I'm going to back that one up it, because I don't do this. But there are there are ministers on stage who will say, uh, can I get a witness to this? Which means, is anybody going to amen me? Mm-hmm. Uh, is anybody going to agree with me? Um, amen. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, another one is, well, I'll pray for you. Uh, when you're having, you're listening to somebody and their issues, I'll pray for you. I really don't like that one either. Uh, if you're going to pray for them, just stand right there and pray for them. Do it now. I'll pray for you means you probably won't because you'll go away and forget about uh, I'll pray for you is is Christianese. Um, well, he's backsliding, you know. What does that mean? It means that somehow he is not keeping up with Jesus on his walk with Jesus, I guess. Uh, hard to explain this without some Christianese to explain it. Another example, um, oh, uh, you tell me that you're going to Europe. I'll pray for traveling mercies. Oh, that the plane will be on time? That uh, what are traveling mercies? That I, don't, I don't know what that means even. And I, I'm fluent in Christianese. But sometimes I'm fluent with phrases that I and I don't know what they mean. I was um, pri- privileged, honored uh, of working in a mega church, and uh, that church was Saddleback Church, uh, whose main uh, or at least first campus was in Lake Forest. It is still in Lake Forest, California. Um, a church has over 500 paid employees. And it may be a little bit more now. There were 40, 50, no, there were 50 to 75 pastors in that church. We didn't all know each other. We recognized each other probably. But in order to get a job and to work uh, as an employee at Saddleback Church, there were several interviews that uh, all the applicants had to go through. My interview with them was the last one, and it was the theological interview. I asked them a series of questions about their beliefs. Uh, I did not use theological terms for the most part, but I listened to some of the answers, and many of the applicants were people who have grown up in the church, have been, uh, I would hope, discipled in the church, taught in the church. And one of the questions I asked was, how does a person become a Christian? How does a person... uh, find their way into the family of God. How does a person, uh, and I wouldn't say be saved, because that's kind of Christianese too. The answer uh, often was, well, uh, you just invite Jesus into your heart. I have no idea what that means. And I'm a pastor, and I have no idea what that means, to invite Jesus into my heart. So I would respond by saying, uh, can you say that in a different way? Can you state that differently? And usually the answer was no, I can't. You just, you know what I mean. You just invite Jesus into your heart. Well, if someone is outside of the kingdom, is not a Christian, and they ask you, how can I become a Christian? And you say to them, just invite Jesus into your heart. What are they supposed to do with that? They're not going to understand that. Um, Another example is, I was um, I was called to uh, move to uh, Amarillo, Texas. I've been called. I doubt that. People are not called to a place. They're called to a way of life. They're called to uh, behave with the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God has given to them or does give to them at any particular time. Uh, well, I just, I don't feel called. I, it's like I don't feel led. I don't feel called to uh, do what you, it means I don't want to do what you want me to do. Uh, and so we have all of these. I have other examples, but that might be enough just to get an idea of what Christianese is. Now, my 
thoughts about Christianese are it's a language that is not created by God. Christianese, because uh, of its nature of being just within the kingdom of God, just within the community of Christians, excludes people who are outside of the Christian uh, community. And we don't want to exclude. We want to be all inclusive as Christ is. We want everybody to come into the kingdom of God. Well, if we have this little jargon that we use, these phrases that we use, um, that's going to make us look like an exclusive club. And, you, okay, you talk like this. Do you have a secret handshake? What happens in the uh, potluck basements of the church? Uh, do you have... Um, is a uh, seven bean salad actually required by your culture? You see, we're pushing all these people away, or at least we are putting up a wall that is preventing them or inhibiting them from coming into the kingdom. That's why I don't like it. Uh, I don't like it Christianese. Now, when you're talking to somebody, you need to consider your audience, right? When when you're talking to little children, you don't talk the same way as you're talking in a boardroom of a corporation. You consider the audience. Well, when you're talking to somebody outside who is not a Christian, consider they don't understand these things. They haven't been used to these phrases. uh, And we have to use words that are... Um, are clear to them because we're trying to convey a message to them uh, in answer to their question, how do I become a Christian? What do I have to do? Make sure you know uh, a simple definition of what you're talking about. Um, Albert Einstein is attributed of saying that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Now, you and I are teachers and Our job is to convey concepts, thought processes, content to our students. We have to put ourselves in their place. And what are they listening to? And are they understanding what we're saying? If they don't understand what we're saying, we can read facial expressions that, and we should, and then explain in another way or ask them to ask questions so that we can uh, explain to them what we're what we're trying to convey to them uh, without being exclusive we're not a secret club you don't have to have a secret key to get into our uh, community you are welcome in our community and if a person is not fluent in the language you're speaking and that could be someone Uh, whose first language is American English, but they don't speak it well, don't understand it well. And we need to change the way we speak uh, and the way we we talk to them. I don't want to be an exclusive culture. I don't want to have uh, any kind of appearance that you're an outsider and I'm an insider. I want to have open arms. And that means language with open arms, too. The openness can be prevented by Christianese. We speak that language and um, use those phrases, and people don't understand what we're talking about. Now, it's, this is not Christianese, but theology has technical words, too. I can talk about the peccability and the impeccability of Christ and the hypostatic union will help you understand what, okay, if I'm going off in that kind of language, another person who has studied theology and understands those things will understand what I'm saying. The guy I'm sitting next to on the bus is not going to get that at all. And so we change depending upon who our audience is. It, it, it creates openness when we do that instead of uh, presenting openness. Uh, There are times when Christianese can hide really bad theology. Uh, If a person is, now theology is is an ology, it's it's a study, Uh, but logos, ology comes from logos, it just means word. It just means, and so theo is God, theology is just talking about God. That's all it is, is talking about God. What language do we use? 
we use a language that uh, is can be received by somebody uh, who's not in our community. Another example of Christianese, um, they come to our church and uh, the praise and worship pastor or the praise and worship leader, oh, Christianese, the P&W guy, the P&W guy stands up uh, with a guitar in his hand and four or five people on microphone, and he says, uh, let's pray before we worship. What? It's like prayer isn't worship. It's like the only way to worship is singing, and we call that the worship. Uh, that messes up the theology of what worship is. Uh, we're doing life together. There's another one. What does that mean? You're living together in the same house? I would avoid that kind of, of phrasing. Uh, who doesn't do life together? Anybody you run into is doing life. Um, intentional is another word. Um, I want to do, um, uh, let me just start over with this one. Intentional is another Christianese word. Uh, well, I go to church intentionally. Well, how else could anybody go to church if it's not intentional? I think that's supposed to mean I go to church and uh, I have a uh, expected result from my going to church. I want to... Um, it's my purpose for I'm going to church. I don't, the word intentional is, uh, is misused. Okay, the point is, we are going to create, if we are a subculture, a feeling or an appearance in our subculture that you have to be a special kind of person, you have to do a certain thing to get in. Inclusive, is almost always more loving than being exclusive. We do not want to be exclusive. And I say almost always. Um, we, it is appropriate sometimes to exclude children from some activities, like a men's retreat or a women's retreat. I've never really liked the idea of men's retreats anyway. I've been on more than... Uh, probably anybody who's listening to us. Uh, why don't we have women's retreats and men's retreats together and just call them adult retreats? Well, that creates exclusivity that you can't come to our retreat because you're a woman. You can't come to our... That's not the way the kingdom uh, operates. That's not the way Christ operates. He doesn't get together with... Um, an exclusive group of people and have communication with them only. All right, um, talk to me. Say something about what we've said uh, in, uh, uh, about Christianese here. I don't like it. You got that point? I got that point. Uh, yeah. And kind of growing up in the church as well and, and hearing sermons, chapels, being around fellowship even that word fellowship is just like what is that like hey we're gonna we're gonna start with fellowship and then get into the discussion uh, like, fellowship, fellowship means um we're gonna hang out and eat <laughs> yeah we are uh fellowship means uh pie and coffee after the bible study that's right yeah uh, that doesn't even make sense it's non-biblical it's actually anti-biblical okay sorry and, and it's just no you're exactly it's just one of those things where you kind of like hmm they said that I'm like I don't I don't know I don't really know what that means and so that exclusivity part was like oh okay that that those were some new thoughts so well the, the Greek is word nice, yeah. for fellowship is koinonia and there are churches who have groups small groups cell groups um, what else are they called koinonia groups and would you like to come to our koinonia group with what what are you talking <laughs> about so uh, I interrupted. And I'm so glad I did. No, yeah, I just, interrupted. <laughs> just understanding that Christ, Christian, like, what are some of the phrases, and, and those are those are good things to know. And with new context, as a new person who's going to church, these are things that are are good to know. And also, 
sit like looking in the mirror. I'm like, do I say those things? Do am I the person who's spewing Christianese as well in order to cover up something that I may not understand myself? Well, I have recognized Christianese for a long time. And by the way, um, well, let me just finish that thought. I have recognized Christianese for such a long time that when my brain thinks in Christianese, I can stop it from coming out of my mouth. I don't want to, I'm, I'm going to rephrase so that somebody I'm talking to can understand what I'm saying. Um, there are certain, I mentioned theology that um, can be hidden in Christianese. Uh, for example, if somebody comes to me and says, well, I'm having, um, I'm having surgery on Wednesday at three o'clock and I could use the prayer. Well, okay, I'll pray for you uh, Wednesday at three o'clock. What's that about? That's just an ignorance of God's timing and God operates outside of time. He operates inside of time, but he can also, and he exists outside of time. He invented time. It doesn't have to be at three o'clock that I pray for that person. Could, uh, could I pray after three o'clock that the surgery, could I pray a week from now uh, from the surgery that the surgery would go well? The answer is absolutely yes, because God can do, uh, hear those prayers, uh, know they're coming anyway, and operate uh, uh, outside of, of time. Um, why, it was just this morning that I prayed for the safe arrival of the Mayflower. <laughs> I can't wait until I get to heaven and somebody who's on the Mayflower comes up and says, thank, thank you for the you. prayer. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christianese can, can hide poor theology and be exclusive, uh, and I don't want to be that. Yes. So I don't use it. Well, we will continue our study in Christianese. And if you guys have any encounters with Christianese, please let us know your favorites so that way we can share them on air and have a laugh or oh. have enjoy, enjoy ourselves with um, our interactions. Yeah, Jim. If you want more, um, more Christianese definitions, go online. Just search Christianese and all these dictionaries will come up many dictionaries, and they will have the Christianese and the American English equivalent. Uh, some of them are funny. Some of them are just definitions, but there are many. You can find many. That way you can avoid using them. There we go. And speaking of using a dictionary and all things classroom related and our study in Christianese, we have finals coming up here soon at CBCS, and some of the questions I get in my class all the time, especially in math, are how do I study for your test? How can I be prepared to do, can I, how can I be prepared to regurgitate what you want from me? And so in math, I come up against this idea that nobody knows how to study for math. Well, for me, it's just <laughs> like... You practice problems. Uh -huh. You go out, y'all, like sometimes if it's procedural, you just change the numbers. And I, I ask the kids all the time, like, how much did you study for the test? They're like, 20 minutes. Okay, what did you do for 20 minutes? I looked at my notes. I'm like, okay, so you stared at a piece of paper and didn't do anything practical? Like, hey, how did you prepare for that game? I watched film. So you didn't run any plays? So, Jim, for your class, for ASL, for your time in education, uh, what are your thoughts on studying? How, what is the best way to prepare for an exam or a final or whatever our students may have in front of them? What, what are your, what's your take? Well, okay. Um, American Sign Language classes are not just sign language. We study a culture, too, and the deaf have a culture. The people who use uh, American Sign Language are not all deaf. There are many hearing people who use that. It's actually the third uh, most widely used language in the United States, which stuns some people. Um, so we have uh, what I call sign to paper finals, where I sign and they write down in English what it is that I've signed. But then we have another part that's objective because we talk about other things. I teach the anatomy of the ear. We talk about deaf humor and why it's how it's different than uh, hearing humor. We talk about um, is the deaf. Uh, community really a community or is it a culture? We talk about how people think in uh, 
who, who do not hear and have never heard a language. Okay, all of this stuff I give in a separate part on an objective test with a true, false, multiple choices, multiple, hey, it's plural, by the way, multiple choices, and uh, fill in the blanks and, and matching, so forth, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I don't do a study guide anymore. I used to give them a study guide so they know how to prepare for the, now, the week before the final, I sit down and tell them everything that's going to be on the final. They still have to know it. And they can take notes as I go through all of these things that I think are going to be important for them to know. And then they, um, this is going to upset the apple cart. They can use their notes on the final. They can't use handouts. It has to be in their handwriting. It has to be personally written. And I approve the notes before they come in uh, or before they take the final. But I, uh, I let them use that. I get to use that. If I forget something, I just go to my notes. If I forget uh, a, a particular way to do to sign something, I can go to my notes. I can go to ASL dictionaries. Um, I'm fine with that. Now, I'll tell you this, and this may upset some people. I don't like finals. My job is to not grade people. It's to assess them to assess their skills. I know their skills before we even pass out these finals, before we even take the finals. But I'm required by the school, and I think it's probably a good requirement. I just don't weigh them very heavily because they're people who have test anxiety, and the test anxiety uh, does not uh, adequately express what their knowledge is or how they could apply the knowledge and so forth. My suggestion to the students is study every day like the test is tomorrow. Every day study. Now, I tell the students, if you want to soar, if you want to do well in this class, 30 minutes every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. If you will spend 30 minutes outside of class practicing, learning American Sign Language, you will soar in this class. I can't enforce it. I can see that it happened or it didn't happen, but that's my suggestion to them. And that was your question. How do, they, how do you prepare uh, for the? You keep going the whole way. You get together outside of class with another student who's taking the same subject and discuss these things. Practice the math problems together. Work this out and figure out how you would uh, solve this problem. It's critical thinking. So there's my suggestion to the students uh, and then I want them to have rest I want them to have a time when they're not working on all of this I never have uh, a quiz or a test or anything due on a Monday or the day after they get back from a holiday because that time off is time for family and time for friends and then I believe they will be more enthusiastic if they know they do not have to study on weekends uh, I don't want them to but I wouldn't prevent them if they're eager. But there's, uh, there's some guidelines that I use in the class. Very good. Yes, for me, the, the time I knew I wanted to be a teacher was in high school because of a study group that I did. We would have uh, five, six friends over in the same class. We'd go get pizza. We'd have a whiteboard in the middle of our ping pong table. <laughs> and we would hammer out math for hours and prepare for a test. And it was also nice just to be with friends and kind of enjoy that productive struggle together. So my big thing was practice problems and study groups because it's nice to go along with somebody who has a different opinion and maybe a, a more fun way to solve something that might be a little simpler. But practice, practice, actually do hand write out what you're going to do yes. and then see it and then adapt and maybe throw some different obstacles at you on the way too. Well, my students, my faculty, uh, brothers and sisters here, my colleagues in the faculty sometimes come to me and say, you know, uh, the students are signing in my class. And I'm saying to them, oh, I'm so sorry that's happening. You know, just call them down on the inside. I'm saying, yes, I'm so happy they're doing that. Don't do it during quizzes. Um, what's, what's the answer to number 14? Oh, it's C. No, don't do that. But... Uh, Use this language. Use it outside of class. Uh, and then eager students will do that. And I can tell which ones have done that. 
and they become good at it. Fantastic, Jim. Thank you so much for your insight into all things Christianese and all things studying. Uh, looking forward to interacting with you guys uh, over email at brewingwithjim at gmail.com. So please interact with us. Send us your questions. Send us your feedback. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Jim, for all your time and your insight. And thank you all for listening. My pleasure. And uh, we'll get together soon and do life together and love on each other. And, and walk. Uh, and walk. Uh, walk the path. That's right. Yes, we'll walk the talk. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Have a good week. The topics covered and answers offered in Brewing with Jim mine the wisdom attained from a life of pastoral ministry and care. They do not constitute professional or clinical training or expertise in the areas of counseling or mental health. CVCS and its podcast network want to provide a platform for the discipleship of our community. Brewing with Jim is our attempt to foster that environment in a format that is accessible and open for all to partake in. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and may or may not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Capistrano Valley Christian Schools or its faculty. The material and information presented here are for general information purposes only. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Capistrano Valley Christian Schools is a Christian JK-12 school in San Juan Capistrano, California. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.